So my name's Adam Vane, and over the last 20 years, thanks to my education here, I've had the opportunity to work and support through training and coaching programs, CEOs of Fortune 500s and their executive teams, mid-sized companies and startups, and the question of leadership often comes up. And there are a lot of lenses to leadership. And you can map some of those lenses to some of the schools here. So for the business school, there's strategic planning. In psychology, there's talent management. There's a law lens, right? There's a public relation lens. But in working and speaking to uh, CEO advisory groups, peer advisory groups uh, for many, many years, and some of the conversations that come up at tables where different uh, CEOs and leaders talk to each other, those aren't necessarily the kinds of lenses that come up. Oftentimes, what comes up in those conversations are difficult conversations. And a difficult conversation is any conversation where the thought of having it gives you sort of a, a funny feeling, like a queasiness in the pit of your stomach. And you know you need to have this conversation, but something is stopping you, right? There are a number of things. Maybe you're not quite sure how to handle it. So there's a skill problem. And, uh, or it may be just a fight or flight response that we're learning more and more about as we study the neuro aspects of leadership. But there's not only a psychological cost, there's also a financial cost. And the last major study of conflict and difficult conversations in 2008 by Consulting Psychologist Press. They assessed uh, in conversations with 5,000 leaders and managers around the world. And just the US cost of difficult conversations was $360 billion in paid hours, 385 million working days. And when they began to divide that out into these subcategories, 80% of respondents experienced conflict with other departments and teams. 65% said there are too many cook cooks in the kitchen and there's confusion about who is doing what. 40% said communication with organizational leadership is ineffective. And 25% said just trying to avoid conflict kills morale and causes illness and absence work. That sound familiar to you? Right. So there are four costly sources of conflict. The first is when you have a relationship and you have the same level of power, right? Two peers. So that's peer conflict. We need to learn how to manage that. Uh, meeting management, that's where, say, you're running a meeting and Three people are silent, and one person is taking up all the space in the room. How many people have ever been in that situation? <laughs> right. So that's very costly. Uh, managing up is where you're managing up to power. right? And we know that that's a huge problem, because we're afraid that you know, that's when our limbic system, that part of our brain that triggers the neurochemical fight or flight response, that's where that really goes crazy. Our prefrontal cortex responsible for logic shuts down and then we really become afraid. But the one we're going to talk about today is managing down, performance management, where you have some authority or level of power, and you're trying to give feedback to someone who reports to you. OK? So the goals for the session first are to understand the impact of personal style and communication styles on, our, uh, on how we deliver information. I'm going to go over two guardrails. And what I mean by guardrails are, is there some sort of place of safety we can go to when we're delivering these performance management conversations that give us the room and the space to deliver the feedback we want to deliver and influence other people to our way of thinking? And the third is we're going to go over seven steps of performance feedback. And there's a handout on your table we'll review. Okay? So, so for the first exercise, what I'd like you to do is just take a few minutes and think back. Think back over the last two weeks. And is there a time, one situation, where you gave performance feedback that wasn't well received? Or think about a time when you could have given performance feedback and didn't. And now you're thinking about it. It's keeping you up at night. I want you to take a minute in order that we can make this real and not just something that's intellectual, but something real. And just think about that. 
and maybe make a few notes. Okay? I'll give you one minute to do that. Okay, so what I want to do now, if you have something, is I want to very quickly go over the communication styles that have been studied for many, many years, going back to Hippocrates and the study of the four humors, right through Carl Jung and his work on behavior, and through other people like uh, Isabel Myers and Lucy Briggs, who came up with the Myers-Briggs typology, DISC, social styles. How many people are familiar or have taken some kind of psychometric like that and are familiar? So, each one of these, there's a four-quadrant model. And what we know is, is in these four quadrants are sort of places of focus or energy. And we ha in, in each of those four areas, we have all four of those within us. But we tend to have a primary energy that we focus on and a secondary. And usually there's one Achilles heel, one of those places of energy where it's very low for us. And it's the person in our organization who has that as their primary style, it's the person that we have the conflict with. Over and over and over, that seems to be what happens. So, sorry, I got a so if we think about um, uh, the first one, which is what we call that driver energy, which is that which is in us that is really focused on action and results. This is the part of us that wants our results done now, right? Come on, let's get it done, people. Very low affect. Let's go, let's get it done. The challenge with that style, though, is people tend in the, that follow that style tend to be less tactful, right? In fact, of all four styles, those people tend to be the worst listeners. And I'll say that again for those of you that are drivers in the room. <laughs> tend to be the worst listeners. Okay, how many people know someone, managing someone in that style, that's their primary style? How many people know that they are that style? Right. The second is the expressive. These are people that love recognition, fun, applause. They love to be seen. And as a result, they tend to talk a lot. And what do they talk about? Themselves, right? Oh, that reminds me of me. Let me tell you a story. Right? And that's great. We need a focus on ideas and that sort of temporal focus on the future. Right, that creativity, that's very important. But the challenge is, for that style, people in that primary style, is they tend to be less organized. And they tend to sort of like great starters, but not so great finishers. How many people know somebody in that style, or are that style? And you're managing that. The third style is the relators. Those are people who really value people. These are people who are sensitive. They're great. They're the best listeners of all of them. Right? And they really, they tend to focus on, let me, let me I want to hear more about you, Tom. Tell, hey, how are you? Nice to see you, right? And they tend to, they're very friendly, but underneath the surface of that friendliness, the way that they manage difficult situations is they have difficulty asking for what they want. So they will then accommodate and then feel resentful. So that's going to be the person on your team who, yeah, it's fine, boss, yeah, it's great, no problem, yeah, it's great. In the meantime, they've got this sort of book, and every time they get crossed, there's a little X that they put there. And then there's another X. And then there's another X. And finally, when I get to the bottom of the page, that's when they explode. So those are the people you have to say, no, I really want to hear what you have to say. No, you really need to take a vacation. Because they will accommodate and just keep pushing themselves because their focus is on people and consensus and doing for others. The fourth is the analytical style. These are people that value accuracy and data. And um, they're all about making sure that we get things right. And if you want something done right, then you give it to someone who has an analytical style. But if you want it done on time, not so much. Because they can tend to get stuck in analysis paralysis. And if you ever worked with an IT department, you can know that it's like there's a not enough data in the world to be able to execute. How many people understand, though, that style? Familiar with that? OK, so those are the four styles we want to be aware of. Now, the best way to steer behavior, okay, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this. But the best way to steer behavior, and particularly for alumni leaders, the best way to steer behavior is to positively motivate. Right? So people need to know that what they do matters to you. So if you could just make a, a list of the people 
that are on your team or the people, if you're a volunteer leader, and write, think about ways to fuel their sense of importance, that's the best way to steer behavior. But that's, unfortunately, not what we're here to talk about today, right? <laughs> so let me just hear from you. What are some examples of some challenging feedback conversations that you've got? Yes? I have a person on my team um, who's really good and accurate, mm -hmm. but has a, a bad attitude. And I don't think it's something she can change. Mm -hmm. She's a really valuable team member. Mm -hmm. So I haven't told that to be so, so a bad attitude. Now, what is it about the bad attitude when you think about behavior? How does she exhibit that bad attitude? <coughs> and she will find a solution. Oh, so she's good at finding a solution. Oh, she wants to blame other people. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you guys want to get into it? So let's take a look. Take your hand out. So there are a couple of guardrails we want to be aware of. And because one of the reasons uh, that I'm sure that it's difficult to give this person feedback is like, how do you get into this without getting a lot of blowback? Am I right? Right. So the first guardrail, so these are the guardrails. Guardrails are what keep us on the path. Okay. So the first is positions. So when I say the word position, all difficult conversations start with a position. A position is just a way of looking at something, right? I'm taking a position, and your position is, wow, she's, she's blaming other people, and she sure gets it done, but unfortunately, there's, there's, there's a side part of it that happens that's not really helpful, all right? So here's the problem with positions. Newtonian theory states, for every action, there's an equal and opposite. Yeah. Right, and I'm here to tell you that for every position you take, there's an equal and opposite position, right? So here's how that works in organizations. Let's say that I am, I'm just going to take it away from this for a moment. Let's say that I am a manager of a functional, uh, uh, of a function in an organization, and Claire is my colleague, and she's also manager of a function. And the truth is, I was supposed to get Claire a report last week that she really needed, but my boss Tom came to me with a hot assignment, and he said, um, you know, you really got to do this. You want to keep your job. So I wasn't able to get that report to Claire. So now it's next week. I'm walking down the hall. I see Claire, and I've completely forgotten about that. And I've got my iPad. I'm walking down the hall. I say, hey, Claire, how's it going? She says, hey, Adam, she kind of gives me a look, right? Now, what's the right thing to do right now? What would be the right thing for me to do right now? Stop. Hey, Claire, I'm so sorry about last week. Look, I had this hot assignment I had to do for Tom. But look, if this ever happens again, I promise you, I'll let you know in five minutes if I can't get something to you. That's called the future-focused agreement to rebuild trust, right? But I don't do that because my mind's working all the time. So instead, I walk back to my office. She says, I say, hi, Claire. She says, hey, Adam. She kind of gives me a look. I walk back to my office, and I think, wow, she had kind of a funny tone in her voice. Then I get back to the office. I go, oh, I remember. And now the right thing to do now would be what? Now that I remember, I'm back in my office. What's the right thing to do now? Call her up on the phone. But that's not what I do. Here's what I do, because I'd like to think of myself as a good person, and I want to make sure that I'm a good person. I go to my colleague, Kathleen, I say, hey, Kathleen, you got a minute to talk? Remember our team was supposed to get that a report to Claire last week, and then we didn't because, you know, how busy we were, and you know how Claire is. She begins to make me white, right? In the meantime, Claire goes to her colleague, Karen. She says, Karen, you remember Adam was supposed to get me that report last week? No, but he didn't, but you know how that team is, right? And that is called... Positional escalation. Now, what we tend to do as human beings is we tend to hope it's going to work out, but it doesn't. <laughs> the nature of conflict is that it tends to escalate. So the first guardrail is to recognize that things will positionally escalate. Everybody with me so far? Which brings us, and the way that they escalate is the way the limbic system, the survival system of the brain works. They will move into a fight pattern, especially the drivers will move into a fight pattern because they tend to control, or a flight pattern, which is what the relators and the analyticals will do, right? A flight pattern, or they might attack and withdraw and some passive aggressive behavior, right? The second guardrail is something I call intelligent confusion. 
And if you can transform your judgment and frustration into this thing called intelligent confusion and curiosity, it's the second best step to managing this conversation. And uh, the way to do that is you want to ask an open-ended question, because open-ended questions are non-positional. Remember, we're trying to avoid positions. And one of my favorite ways to very quickly drop out of the, the limbic neurochemistry that's driving us into illogical things coming out of our mouths is a, a very central open-ended question called help me understand. And so what I'd like to do that I found useful is I'd like for you all to repeat after me, help me understand. 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 If you did nothing else, then the next time you found yourself frustrated, you simply move to help me understand, it will change your life, I promise you. Because help me understand is non-positional. What are they going to say if you say help me understand? They're gonna say, how dare you ask me more about what I think and feel? <laughs> now, I will say that because that lim limbic chemistry, the cortisol, the norepinephrine, is firing in those situations, when I learned this many, many years ago as a man young manager, this is how I did it. I'm like, can you help me? understand, you know, I had to force myself to say it, you know, and, and, and there were the facial tics and everything else. So let me talk about where that has worked in some of the work that I've done. So about 90% of my work is private sector, but one of the things that we do in our uh, consulting practice is we work with high-level UN leaders to help them to guide teams, face down hostile press interviews, and negotiate with rebel factions in Afghanistan and Sudan and Algeria. And I'm proud to say there are 33 country directors around the world that we have worked with and helped to get to this high level role. So uh, one person gave me permission to tell the story. And this was Doug Kay. Uh, you can actually look him up on the internet. And Doug was chief of staff of UN peacekeeping. And he came to me and he said, you know, I'm tired of having this kind of role where it's kind of an admin role, chief of staff. I really want to go on the front lines. It's something I did before. So, he, so this is what you have to do to get to this role. You've already been in the UN for about 10 or 15 years. Now in order to pass this role, you get a test. And the test is, they fly you to London, and the night before this whole weekend long test, they give you a briefing book about this thick. And you gotta memorize that book all night to simulate being exhausted on the ground. So you have to have all that data in your head. Then, first thing in the morning, they put you in a room and they hire actors to put you through four or five different scenarios. And each one of those scenarios maps on to the four kinds of difficult conversations that I talked about earlier. So the first thing you do is you're sitting in there and someone playing a rebel factional leader comes storming in and going, what are you doing in my country? And screaming at you. And the test is you have 20 minutes to sort of calm that person down and come up with an agreement, a future focused agreement. And there are two people sitting there with lists with competency boxes and they're checking it off. And in that 20 minutes, if you are too aggressive, you fail. If you're too passive, you fail. If you're still talking at the end of 20 minutes, they walk out of the room, you fail and you lose those points. Next, they put you in front of uh, someone you have to give performance feedback to who's very politically connected and belligerent. Next, they put you in a room full of angry stakeholders and you've got 20 minutes to come up with a strategic plan that's sort of short-term, medium-term, long-term, using some of the data in the briefing book. Next, they then put you in front of a hostile press interview. So that's managing up. That's the managing up piece, right? So Doug, we worked with Doug. He went through, he passed the test. And it took him about a year to get this role, but he actually got the role of being country director of the largest UN agency in the world in Kabul, Afghanistan. And so he's six months in the role, and we're connected on Facebook, and I see, and you can see this video where he's facing on this, this, this press interview, uh, if you look up his name, uh, Doug Kay. But um, he just nailed it. He nailed this press interview. And so I, yeah, I am'd him. I said, Doug, that was just so incredible what you did. I'm so proud of you, et cetera, et cetera. And he ironed me right back from Kabul. He says, I have to tell you, I use the principles we talked about every day, including help me understand. So if it works for him, Maybe it'll work for you. Yes. 
Now, there's another way for the data-oriented people in the room. When you think about the way communication is sent through the ethos, right? We know it's that we send it through body language and tone of voice and facial expressions. But when you just think about the content itself, there's a certain percentage of content as you're speaking to people that gets lost and some that gets kept and integrated. And what do you think, percentage-wise, as I'm sending information out, what percentage do you think is kept and what percentage do you think is lost on average? One. One is kept. <laughs> 10 is kept, 90, yeah. 10, 90, anybody else? What's that? 80, 20? Yep, that's right. So Pareto is right. 20 to 25 percent, 75 to 80 percent lost. So does everybody, does that sound right to people? Okay. If you agree with that, then you remember earlier when I said if you can transform your judgment and frustration to intelligent confusion, what you've all just admitted to is that you are confused 85 to 90 percent of the time. <laughs> you've just admitted that, and that is the truth we tend to be very confused about our position. There's some confusion here about your position. She has a whole story about why she blames her, why she's doing what she's doing. The trick is, how do we get into this in a way that we bring out the truth of what's in the middle? Because by staying in our position, we tend to keep, here's the thing, you are all, from my experience, you're all five minutes away from a breakthrough in some of the most difficult conversations you're dealing with, but you never had the chance to really practice or learn how to do this. Five minutes away. But the five minutes tends to be, it's like, here's you with your positions, here's the other person with their positions, and as you hold on to those positions, you're always five minutes away. You get it? You're like pushing it away. So let's go over the handout. So the first thing you want to do is you want to do it quickly face-to-face, -face, and in private. And some of the language here, by the way, what I'm talking about, please, I hope you know that these are all suggestions. You will have your own way of saying whatever you say, so I, I never ask you to do it exactly like I do it. You always make, have it make sense to you. But there is some language here that I think is useful. So do it quickly, face-to-face, -face, and in private. Management skills 101 is you never give feedback in public, because that's highly embarrassing to people. And they will find a way to either consciously or unconsciously sabotage you, okay? So, hey, Kim, I'd like to check in with something I've noticed. Why do we use the word noticed? Because noticed is non-positional. They can't say, you didn't notice that, right? If you come in with, why did you do this? Well, they can come up with a defense. So you want to stay non-positional. So, so what was it that you noticed specifically about this person? Yes. Okay, sorry. Sorry, I looked away. Okay. So, so um, what specifically have they said recently that would be an example of that? They said, oh, you know, Carrie, do you remember the more language? I'm going to talk about this Thursday number again, but you know, I came on Monday and blah, blah, blah. Okay. What does the 13, let's give the 13 member an imaginary name. Um, Charles. And let's give this person an imaginary name. Kim, yeah. Kim. Yeah. yeah, okay. So the first step would be, so hey, Kim, you got a second to talk? Right? And the reason we say that you have a second to talk, even though I'm a boss, is you always want to give the space for choice. Because when they say yes, every time they say yes, right, that is an agreement. And every time there's an agreement, they are motivated internally to keep their word. So the small yeses that get you to the future focus agreement we're looking for here are very important to bring this forward. So, hey, so can you play Kim for a second? second? Sure. Hey, Kim, do you have a second to talk? Hey, so I want to talk, some of the things I noticed the other day was when you were talking about the project, I really appreciate, first of all, all the work you've done and just your, your solution-focused you know, way of doing things around here. I noticed that you had some, some issue around Charles. Can you, so what was, what was that all about? Well, you know, Charles is great, but he's careless, and he pays attention to each other. Okay. So for you, Charles uh, is, is not paying to attention to a lot of details. You get a sense of what style Kim is? Which style is Kim? Analytical, right? Maybe. Is that true? A lot of details are extremely important to her? Yeah. 
Low affect? Yeah. yeah, that's right. So already now you have some sense of what's important to her, which are details, right? So, you know, Kim, one of the things I appreciate of you is that, is that you're very detail-focused. And it's because you're detail-focused that I wanted to have this conversation with you, which is that I notice in, when you give your on the way to solutions, one of the things I've noticed is that, that you really have an issue around how Charles is doing something. Ah, no, I know. And I can, so here's what you want to do. You want to begin to, the next step is to ask questions and paraphrase. So you want to get to surround them with their own truth because they all have a story. Now, the reason that we don't allow them to do this, the reason that we interrupt, right, is because, because unconsciously, we feel like if we allow them to continue to talk to us, we will die. <laughs> I'm serious. That's what's happening. That's, what you're, that's the message that the oldest part of your brain is sending you. If I don't interrupt right now and get my side out, I'm going to die. But really, when you think about how long does it take you to tell your side of a story, how long does it take? If you're telling, say if you were Kim and you're complaining about this to a friend, how long really would it take to tell that story? Five minutes. That's the five minutes. We don't take time to fully hear the other side of the story. So Kim, for you, it's all about Charles. So tell me a little bit more about Charles. Charles is very lucky and So what I'm doing is I'm validating her side of the story. And what I'm doing is down-regulating, if you want the technical term, the allostatic load in the lateral nucleus of her amygdala that is going to keep her defending. So there's about five minutes of that, OK? So, so you see that's step number three. Now, what's the downstream impact of her doing this? Why do we care that she complains? Who cares? Where? So she does it with other people. Yeah. Okay. It, it, it's, it's a lot of information. <clears throat> there, so. Right, right. And then other people take that. So. Yes. So and we don't have to get into an, a, a whole psychological thing. We just have to get to uh, the behavior. Right? So we're always trying to describe the behavior and move away from evaluations. Describe the behavior. So, so Kim, so I can understand how it's very frustrating because you're trying to get things done. I get that. I guess, so here's, do you mind if I share with you sort of what I've noticed? Kim? Right, so now we're beginning to move to deliver feedback on the behavior, not the person. Right? So what I've noticed is that you share that with me and I can understand how frustrating that is with you. And, it, and I'm wondering, it seems to me that you're being sharing it with other people as well, your frustration with Charles. Am I right? A little bit? So when you think about sharing your frustrations with people, now, this is where we see, see where step five, we're starting to go into the downstream impact. Here's the thing about downstream impact. You need to pull the downstream impact out of her mouth to a state of realization. So she realizes what she's doing. That's the open-ended questions that are non-positional that begin to pull the truth out of her rather than mine saying, you know, You've been talking a lot to other team members, and that's really not a good thing. No, I haven't. Yes, you have. No, I haven't. There we are with positional escalation. Trying to avoid that. Everybody with me so far? OK, so we want to move to the downstream impact. And my goal is to pull the downstream impact from her. So, so Kim, here's, like, I can understand how it's so frustrating when Charles doesn't come through around the execution of what he's promised. And, and one of the things I've noticed, I've noticed that you've shared that with me. And so ha have you also shared this with others? Right, and when you think about sharing that frustration with others, what do you think the impact is on the team? Probably not the best. Not the best, exactly. See what I did? I got her to admit it. So I guess, you know, when we think about sort of team, now you can get into all the stuff that you talked about to me earlier here. You know, when we think about team cohesion collaboration, I guess I'm just wondering, you know, what sort of ste steps you could take to kind of maybe ameliorate this? What would that be? Um, I don't really know. I want you to be her. So, and I completely understand. Notice what, all I'm doing is paraphrasing back and understanding her point of view so that she doesn't get positional. I can completely understand uh, your being frustrated. 
And again, coming back to the sort of the side conversation where you're sharing that with others, I'm just wondering how effective that's been with Charles. Right, exactly, Kim. I don't think he knows either. And so what I'm wondering is, is that by complaining to other people about it, is that solving the problem? Yeah. Right, so it may be, in fact, creating another problem, right? Yeah, great, thank you, Kim. So that's why I want to know what steps. See, I'm, I'm trying to pull it. I'm not trying to say, could you stop doing that? I can do that, but I'm trying to pull out of her. Everybody with me? So what, so what can I count on you for around this, around, these, around the way you're sort of just spreading it out? Because I'll help you with, how, with Charles. I don't, I'm not no, no, no. It's, it's, I'm, I, no, I'm going to help her by coaching her. Exactly. So can I count on you for that? Yeah. Okay. Now I have a future-focused agreement. She has made a promise, and now she's motivated by her interest in keeping her word. Now she's internally motivated. Everybody see what I'm doing here? Okay. I'm going to take some more questions. Yeah. When you do the leading questions to get the other to agree, how do you do that so that it doesn't become um, I've had situations where people have done that to me, and it's, it's very condescending in a way. Yes. It doesn't yes. so it doesn't be done right. Because the, the way to do it is to bring authenticity and real caring to the conversation. And here's, here's what happened to me. This is how I got to it, because it's not an easy thing, because you've got all this stuff going on, and you're like, you know, how do you think it is when you begin to talk to other people, right? That can come across that way. So you've got to move to real intelligent confusion. And here's how I got there. When you actually begin to move to help me understand, this is what happened to me years ago. And I would say, so help me understand. And I'd say, you know, wasn't it about A, B, and C? Isn't that what it was about? And they'd say, no, boss, it was about, you know, something else. Don't you remember we said we were going to use this particular supplier? And I'd go, and then I began to realize how confused I was. And over time, as I began to realize how confused I was, as opposed to, intellectually understanding it, which is what we're getting to here today, which is why you're asking a very good question. As you really move to intelligent confusion and understand how confused you are about what's going on around you, you actually move to a natural place of, I really want to know. It's not easy, especially if you notice yourself having that. But the more authentic you can be, the less you're going to be tripped up by that. Does that make sense? OK. All right. So I'm going to just go over a case, and we'll take more questions. So this was. A uh, brilliant CEO of a um, $50 million tech firm. And, uh, and, and investment bankers love this guy. He is a classic expressive, right? Attorneys love him. He's built this company from nothing. And the call I got was actually from his partners. Because it seems as though he had gone to the Steve Jobs School of Management. And by that, I mean he was, he was having emotional outbursts, right? And he was so micromanaging that he wasn't able to travel on the road and pull in the kind of work he needed to do. So what we needed to do as part of the goals of the coaching program was to reduce the emotional outbursts, teach him some feedback skills, and get him on the road selling. So as part of that program, we had 10 stakeholder interviews. And Here's the thing about collecting data, when you're collecting data as a consultant and you're feeding back to someone when you're interviewing a bunch of people. The important part of when you're giving that feedback, it has to have just enough sting to wake that person up and then just enough love to motivate them to want to take action. So we did uh, the partner feedback intervention where they, you know, we, we gave them the feedback and then the partners spoke to him and we did. Um, six months of leadership coaching, and the outcome was he was more focused. We worked on his triggers, because uh, we have a whole protocol for dissolving the neurochemistry associated with traumatic memory that we use in our practice. So we work from the inside out and the outside in. And I actually asked him after six months, so what do you think the impact was? I said, when you think monetarily, and he said, oh, easily, $18 million. So, I want to take some more questions. We've got some time. What other questions do you have? Any other real situations? No questions? You all got it? OK. Question. I find that, I find that point number one, 
number two, you can't get past that often with combative people and children. They will not agree on the facts. <laughs> 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 That's right. But in UN and diplomatic people who are just bad, as well as children, they don't seem to have any motivation, the same as you, to get to that, ah, we'll give you a compliment and let's agree on the facts. Often you just stay on disagreeing on the facts, and then you'll never get to the next step, which is, oh, we, we all agree on facts. That's because, and I'll, I'll tell you why that is. So first of all, there's a, there's a lot of nuance in that, in that question and the statement underneath the question. Uh, first of all, with kids, depending on how old they are, right, is how much they can be rational. But I've actually worked in some of the toughest schools. I work with over 1,000 kids right after grad school in some of the toughest schools in the five boroughs in the Bronx and Washington Heights. And so I've worked with kids who, uh, who are dealing with conflict and leadership. And the key there is to teach them how do you actually feed back the anger, the frustration that someone else is saying to surround them with their own truth and calm them down. That's how these UN leaders work with those rebel factional leaders. I'm not saying that uh, I can inject that into you right now so you can understand it. Right? You just kind of have to, I mean, that, my experience is you can learn it. And that piece is learning how to de-escalate the situation very quickly by surrounding someone with their own pain. Because it's the pain and the suffering and the perception that you don't understand what I'm, how I think and feel. So if you can surround them with, I do understand how you think and feel, then you, do, you are able to get them to a place where they can understand. That's in my experience. Okay. Yeah. So you talked about very important skills. Yes. But isn't the answer, as a as you can, it's really not the solution. Do you have a situation here? I don't. I'm just thinking this is that. You can empathize and get it to come in. But she doesn't have the power to speak. But she does have the power to speak, Charles. This is that, remember what we're doing here is performance management. Yes, that's what this session is about. Oh no, but Charles is a separate problem. Right now we're dealing with Kim. Let me explain what I meant by that. Yes. Yes. The problem is only. If you don't take care of Charles, Charles is still not. I get it. So for you, if we don't take care of Charles, right? Charles needs to have his Charles needs to have his behavior changed. So I just did what I told him I did. I just actually surrounded you with your own truth. Do you notice what I did? And now I got a nod of your head. Okay. So now I can answer the question because now we're at a space of understanding. So, so the next step for Charles is I might coach, there are a lot of options with Charles. I might coach Charles. I might coach her on how to handle Charles. That's just the next problem to deal with. So you're absolutely right. And the answer is, yeah, they're right. Charles is a problem. Now we either deal with Charles in whatever way, depending on how Charles is. Does that answer your question? Cool. Anybody else? Yeah. Right, so I, um, I referee soccer. You what? I referee soccer. Oh, we're going with kids again. And, um, <laughs> we have this technique. Oh, good. And we, we're going to say, we're going to say, Coach, you're yelling at the, at, the, at the other referees. I'm asking you to comment. All right. And he's coming. I come over and I say, I tell the coach, you have to, you have to knock it off now. Yeah. Because the next thing you come over, if he does it again, he's dismissed. So How's, that working? How's that working for you? Sometimes I go right to dismiss. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we have some more time, and yeah, go ahead. Any tips for dealing with people who just love to be positioned? Who is the oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No matter what you do, they're going to create the opposite position. So it, it all comes down to when, when you understand the nuances of each of these steps, it will all become clear to you, but it's going to take practice, right? So. So someone who loves being positional, loves being argumentative, loves to maybe be in control, is this a driver kind of, is this a driver kind of person? And do they report to you? Do they report to you, this person? I'm just asking a question. I know. And, and this, 
So, so in order to put it in a context, if this person reports to you, because that's our sessions about, right? Somebody report, this is managing down. So, because we're not, I can't answer every question about conflict in the world. If I had three days, I could do it. So I got to put it in this context. <laughs> I could. <laughs> so, but, um, so let's say that this person who loves to argue reports to you. Another concept is how do you have a meta conversation? A meta conversation is a conversation about how we're communicating that takes you out of the content of the conflict and suddenly you're up and looking at it from down here. And that's why one of the things I've noticed where you begin to wake this person up, I don't know if you've noticed, but it seems as though, like the, and you describe it, you know, the other, there have been three or four times when you and I have kind of gotten into it. Have you noticed that? Now, that, that person is a, yeah, I've kind of noticed that. Well, how do you think that's working for you in the context of getting things done? See what I did? That's a meta conversation. Draw, draw, so, because he can, he can keep pushing up against you positionally, but if you pull him out through the meta conversation, then that's great questions, by the way. Yeah? How do you deal with the converse in that situation where, how do you deal with the converse in that situation where an individual's role is to be an expediter, an escalator, and a solution driver? Yeah. Too nice and too unpositional. <laughs> yeah. And if you go through this, or they've got what you back and forth, it's okay, yeah, I'll, I'll do all these things. It would be very easy as well. They're too nice because what is, so what's the downstream impact of their being too nice? Um, the levels are not met. Uh, computers are not required on the time of the illness. It's an urgency to drive a solution to change which will limit the impact of the level. And how aware is this person of the downstream impact of their behavior? They what? They've been giving feedback multiple times. So my question is, because oftentimes when I say they've been giving feedback multiple times, the magic is, did you come up with a future-focused agreement where they clearly understood the impact of their behavior downstream? Because here's, here's the truth. How many people here have noticed that when you became a manager and all your past colleagues suddenly got a lot dumber? <laughs> like, you notice that? Some of you have noticed that. Suddenly, that's because when you get to a higher level, you're able to see things that others don't see, and especially my alumni leaders, where you begin to see things, if you become the president of, of an, I was president of uh, Teachers College Alumni Association, you begin to see things that others can't see. So it is your job to make sure they understand the impact of their behavior and that it comes out of their mouth and that they make a future, fo future focus agreement. Now, what if this person keeps doing it? That's the next question, right? So this is called power of three. So the first time you have this conversation, it's a future focused agreement. The second time you have this conversation, you say, you know, I know we had this conversation before. I mean, what happened? The reason we come up with an agreement is because you don't have to re-legislate the entire conversation again. You can say, you know, I remember we talked about, you know, maybe you're being a little too nice and, and it looks like this, this happened again. The deliverable wasn't met. What happened? Open-ended question. They have to explain. Third time you say, you know, uh, this is the third time we've had this conversation. It's called power of three. What do we know about the number three when it comes to feedback. When you think back, when you were five or six years old, how did, how did your parents motivate you? One, <laughs> two, two and a half. We all know what happens when we get to three. So, so if you say, you know, this is the third time, you can still be in intelligent confusion because you're coming from a place of wanting to help this person, right? And the more you realize how beautiful intelligent confusion is in, in ameliorating some of these conflicts you're, you're pushing against or running from, the, great, the greater it is. And it comes with practice. So um, once you get to the third time, now you can begin to move to a formal process through HR. And you know, maybe the, so then you begin to ask the question, so what are you committed to? Because I've noticed it's the third time we've had this conversation. Maybe this role isn't right for you. Maybe I can find you a role somewhere else, and you begin to have that conversation. OK, does that answer your question? All right, so you know what we have time for? We have time. Would you guys like to actually take a four-quadrant assessment and see what your own style is? Yes. Can we hand those out? Have they already handed them out? Some of you got them. Some of you didn't. But you did get it. How did you get it and others didn't? Whatever. We're all going to get one. It looks to me. Hold it up. 
It looks like this. It's a couple of pages. It's coming around. Kathleen, can you help? Can you help for handout? Can you help handout? Here it is. Can you hand it out? Great. And maybe Kathleen can take a stack. Anybody else? Okay, so let's have some fun. Here's what you're going to do. There are four columns on that first page. There are, yes there are. And you're going to put a check mark next to the word that describes you. Now, if you thought that every single one word in every column was you, you would go ahead and put a check mark, but that's probably not the case. So be honest about it. And here's a little hint. If there's a word there and you're not sure that if that word describes you, but your husband, wife, boyfriend, or girlfriend says that's you, it probably is. <laughs> so put a check mark. You're going to add up the check marks, and then you're going to start in the succeeding pages by looking what is the highest number of check marks, and you're going to read that page and see if that describes you. And then the second highest number of check marks, maybe that's your secondary style. If you have the same number of check marks in your columns, then maybe you're both those styles. But really, because you can't really have you know, high reliability and validity with an assessment like this. But it does. There is a lot of people do seem to get a lot of value from it. So you get to decide by reading those descriptions, sort of what's my primary, secondary style. Read all four of them and decide. Which is my Achilles heel? Which of these styles is the lowest for me? Because that's the person in the organization that it's their highest style that's probably going to give me the biggest problems. Because we both have preferences for how we deal with difficult conversations. Yes. Oh, between the four? Uh, not so much. You might think. You know, I'm not sure what studies that they've done. There's a, yeah. there's, yeah, because you would naturally think that because women tend to be more relator oriented that that would be true. Well, do you think about what it takes to succeed in, you know, financial services and Ameri you know, that, that, that kind of behavior. I've had examples from all four, so I don't know of any studies. The best work on gender differences right now that I think is Sylvia Hewlett, if you're interested in women in leadership. Sylvia Hewlett, forget about a sponsor, get a, forget about a mentor, get a sponsor. It's terrific work. We did a, we did a day and a half at a pharmaceutical with, with just training women on that leadership model. It's fantastic. Yep. Sylvia Hewlett, forget about a mentor, ladies, get a sponsor. Someone who's going to back you for that next step. Hewlett, like Hewlett Packard. The response for someone who finds that they're dealing one way in the professional setting and one way in the personal setting is good for you for noticing that. The goal here is not to be put into a box. The goal is to be situationally appropriate and aware of what's tripping me up. So here's how you can use this. You notice that for each style, there's a box of strengths and challenges. Everybody pay attention for a second. Notice, because I invite you to take this throughout the day and just notice how you interact with other people to become more aware for yourself. But if you see the boxes, may I for a second? You see the boxes that say strengths and challenges, right? So say you look, if you look at relator, amiable, easygoing, relaxed, good at, good at finishing what they start. They like things doing one thing at a time. If you want to influence these people, what you want to do is you want to mirror back some aspect of their style, either through talking slower. It's very simple. Either talking slower to match their style or through lower affect. Because if I'm a high expressive, who, do we have somebody who knows they're an analytical? Who here knows they're an analytical? All right, so, so what's your name? Steven. Steven. So if I'm working with Steven and I'm highly expressive, and I have this great idea for Steven, and Steven, you gotta, you gotta listen to this, this is great. 
And I begin to move closer. Already, I'm intruding on his boundaries. This is not cool. So, am I right? Yes, he's already putting his hands up. That's how it is. So, so what happens? What I observe in Stephen is, because he's low affect, right, that I think he's not getting my great idea. So what we do is we tend to do more of what we know. So I said to myself, well, he's not getting it, so I gotta be even more enthusiastic. <laughs> Drives positional escalation. So if you simply tone down and slow down and say, Stephen, do you have a minute to talk? I just, there's this great idea. I don't know, I'd love to get your feedback on it because I don't really know if I have the details right. Already that's like candy because analyticals are really interested in solving problems and setting up systems and details. So that's already gonna be interesting to him instead of, let me tell you about what this is. Right, so just the change in tone and rate of speech can make a difference. Okay, other questions? That's a great question. Yes. Well, so, so the goal of this is to begin to notice. Because there are people that maybe are, because this is all about how much energy do we put into this particular focus? How much energy do we, do we put into driving results? Versus how much energy do we put into expressing ideas and focusing on the future? Versus how much energy do we put on the people and making sure that there's consensus? Versus how much energy do we put into making sure that it's right and we have a system and process? You see how all four of those things are important to be a whole person to drive results? See how that's important? So now, the goal here is to begin to notice your own behavior. Is there one place in some of these challenges where I get stuck? Like, read the boxes. Maybe I'm a little bit of all three. There are some people that are like that. They're three above what's called the energy line. Goal really is just like, yes, be situationally appropriate in the ways that I've described. Other questions? Yes. Yep. The expressive is ideas in the future sales, salespeople, natural salespeople, natural presenters. Applause, recognition, hey everybody, look at me. And real charming, but try to get to the meeting on time, maybe not so much. Try to be organized, maybe not so much. Get the report in on time, maybe not so much. Who, is that, who are we driving crazy with that? The analyticals, those people that are directly, if you look at that last page, directly across. Other questions? All right. So. Because we still have 15 minutes. Do you guys want any more? Are we done or do you want some more information? More? Have I? So, all right. So, so my close is, so I'll do the close now, and then we're gonna, I'm going to give you a little more information. So the, the, the close is that if you can really work on these skills, all right, work on practicing some of these principles, you'll save time, money, and resources, and you'll sleep better at night. That's the close, all right. So now, I wanna to talk to you, that's another case. Right, so there are patterns of behavior that we all have based on the inescapable circumstances in our life. And every time you face an inescapable circumstance from the time you're six or seven, it creates a, a little hitch in your amygdala, in your limbic system. And that hitch is based on an ancient pattern. See, we all tend to be traumatized. We all tend to go through inescapable circumstances. We're traumatized coming down the birth canal. We're traumatized when we didn't make the soccer team. We're traumatized if we woke up and we didn't have the same amount of money that people had around us. Or if we had more money, we were still traumatized. Or you were traumatized the first time you gave a speech. What happens? Any perception of inescapability causes a pattern, and that pattern is generated by that part in your brain that was developed to keep you safe. So 150,000 years ago, when you were in the jungle, or your ancestor was in the jungle and they faced on a saber-toothed tiger, what happens, right? What happens is you see the saber-toothed tiger and you either fight, right, just fight or flight and all the, the norepinephrine begins to generate, and, and, and let's say you escape that tiger. We know that there's the fight or flight mechanism, but what many of us don't realize is that underneath the amygdala is something called the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is responsible for sort of memory, 
Because the amygdala doesn't know from past, present, or future. So if I am able to escape the saber-toothed tiger, and let's say I come back to that force, what the, what the hippocampus is doing in that moment is it's saying it's, no, it's, it's recording the color of the sky and the shape of the trees. And that's so if I escape and come back two weeks later, my hippocampus sees that same pattern in that part of the jungle and says, this is where the tiger is. And that's, I get that same response. Now, that's a natural protective response, right? We want that response when it comes to saber-toothed tigers. But unfortunately, in modern times, what that triggers is something called repetition compulsion. And repetition compulsion is doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different result. We think that that is the definition of insanity. It's not. What it is is it's the brain's protective mechanism for doing that same thing to keep you protected, but it's not. So there is a new approach for dissolving the neurochemistry associated with traumatic memory. And uh, there's a book about it called When the Past is Always Present. Um, I now do that technique as part of my practice. And some of the people that are part of my team do that. And the kinds of things that we're able to do with people stuck in patterns are kind of amazing, like including that one I told you about the 18 million. So I'm going to actually teach you, because it's a simple thing. It's very, very silly. But if you do this and try it for yourself, you may be amazed at what happens. So the idea is, is if you were to close your eyes and you were to call back a memory from the past, and it could just be a stressful memory, right? Something that's stressful. And what you want to do is you want to dissolve it. And what this doctor, Dr. Rudin, who is, he's, got a, he's an internist, he's not a woo-woo kind of guy. He's got you know, 35 years on the Upper East Side, big practice, about 25,000 patients a year. He came up with this over a period of 10 years. And you need to generate the delta waves necessary for dissolving that neurochemical pattern. And the way to do that is simply to rub, well, one of the ways, is to rub from up here down here. Because this strip of skin. If you do this on a one second count, for eight minutes, eight to 10 minutes, you can actually dissolve the neurochemistry associated with the memory to free yourself from the pattern bonds of that memory and so that suddenly it's like it happened to someone else. And the kinds of things that can happen, uh, well, when I did it many years ago, uh, I noticed that I was trying to grow my practice. I was one of the first people to experience this, by the way. And I noticed that I was trying to grow my practice. And I mean, some of you that are entrepreneurs may have noticed that when it, I'm great at doing the work, but when it comes to actually promoting myself and doing the website and all that stuff about me, I, how many people here are like, oh, God, I really got to do that? The relators just raised their hand. So um, I know, and I couldn't figure out why that was. And so I went to see Dr. Rudin. And, um, and in about the third session, he was, you know, there's some detective work when you're doing this over a couple of sessions. He said, tell me what was it like to grow up Jewish in Charleston, South Carolina? <laughs> now, growing up Jewish in Charleston, South Carolina, downtown, I was one of only two Jewish families. The way, when you keep doing this in a pattern, you work with somebody who knows how to do this, and you begin to do the detective work, and you suddenly find some of these, there are plenty of memories, but suddenly he like found that one, and I suddenly remembered being seven years old, and the way anti-Semitism was expressed, they'd say, yeah, you guys are rich. Now, we had the same size house as everybody else, but they'd say, you guys are rich, in this kind of denigrating tone. And so at seven years old, the memory that came up for me was like, we're not rich, we're not rich. And so Dr. Rudin said, oh my god, you've got some unconscious shame about like, being rich. And so suddenly, like three weeks later, I began to notice it was easier to like, do my website. And it was easier to like redo my bio. And I, my wife can tell you, if you talk to her, she's like, what's going on? It seems like it's easier for you. And four years later, I've quadrupled my business. Okay. Then I got certified in it. And now I've worked with over 100 people. And the kind of results are astonishing. So I give you that little tip that it could be helpful. If you simply went home, closed your eyes, and thought of something stressful, and did this for eight minutes, this is just the first step of it. But it's remarkable what can happen. Yes? So the question while you're doing this, are you consciously just thinking, reliving the trauma? 
No. You, what, you, what you do is you, you, so you call the memory to mind. So here's, here's what you call the memory to mind. You, want, you guys want to do it? Yeah. Okay. So close your eyes. Think of a medium stressful. This is not, you know, don't, don't, we don't want anyone to go into their trauma. <laughs> right? It should be something that's somewhat meaningful. Uh, and call it to mind. And I want you to, as you're bringing it up, look, look at the details around it. What happened? Like I could see the kids and their faces. I could see the street, you know, when we called up. Bring up some of the details. And then think of a number between 0 and 10. 10 being the highest level of distress. 0 being no distress. And silently, out loud, all of you, when the number arises, call out the number. Just, just softly call it out. Call it out, call it out. Good, now you can let go and just start to do tops of the shoulders and down, closing your eyes on a one second count. I want you to imagine yourself walking on a beach and each step will cause your distress to diminish will cause you to feel safe, peaceful, and calm. And I want you to count from 0 to 20 softly out loud. This is a one second count. One, just out, softly out loud. Three, four, five, six, seven. You've let go of that memory, you're just on a beach. Eight. Twenty. Now allow a number to float up, and what's the number that floats up now? Just call it out softly. Yeah. So I'm already hearing it's starting to go down. The number's going down. Okay. So let's do this again. Now imagine yourself in a swimming pool, unless you almost drown once and don't do this. Imagine yourself in a nice warm pool, and once again, each stroke is going to cause your distress to diminish. Keep doing this. It takes eight minutes to generate the delta waves, folks. We won't necessarily go eight minutes, but I wanted to give you a little sense of it. Each forward stroke will cause your distress to diminish, will cause you to feel safe, peaceful, and calm. This time, softly count backwards from 20 to 0. Ready? 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, One. Take a nice deep breath. And then what number floats up now? And call out the number. Call it out. Uh -huh. Let's do one more. So I want you to imagine yourself walking in a field. And each step as you pick up a flower is going to cause your distress to diminish. It's going to cause you to feel safe, peaceful, and calm. If you notice yourself getting uncomfortable, that's the cortisol. I would advise you to stay with the stroke, because that's what doing it with someone will help you do to stay in this. So this time you're going to count. You're going to, each time you pick up a flower, it's going to cause your distress to diminish. It's going to cause you to feel safe, peaceful, and calm. You're going to count from 0 to 40 by 2s. Ready? Go. 0, 2.
Take a deep breath. Call out the number that comes up now. Two. Open your eyes. How many people noticed the number went down? Now, my assertion is, if you go back and pull that memory up in an hour, to, if you can get it down to zero in an hour, tomorrow, next week, it'll come up as zero. And you're freed from the bonds of that memory. Here are some of the results. And then we'll, we'll end. So here are some of the results that have happened. This was someone who was an HR uh, development professional in job transition because she was involved in 9-11. And the memory of 9-11 had kept her unable to go down to Wall Street to apply for a job because she was running panic from the buildings. She went on an interview the next day and had a job in one month. The next was a CEO advisor because um, he was a Vistage um, advisor. If anyone here knows Vistage or YPO, um, he had a sense of shame from a lack of closeness to his adult son. And the memory for him was his father being gruff at him at four years old, telling him, stop whining. Reduce the levels of shame, reached out to his son more often. This was a project manager who, after 20 years working for a large consulting company, um, her husband came home and said, I'm leaving you. And suddenly she had a custody battle. And she needed to be calm for the custody battle, even though she had great cause. And uh, she couldn't, even the thought of him, she just began to shake. This was someone who was normally very organized. She had a successful custody outcome and improved her work performance. Uh, this was a big one. Someone who had been serially dating since her teens was dumped by her fiance and had never had, she was in her 40s, and had never had a relationship beyond three months. The memory was early abused by her grandfather from age eight to 11. Within six months, she met the man of her dreams and she's now expecting her first child. And my favorite really is the UN leader. This was someone who was from a Middle Eastern country, grew up from a, in a wealthy family, but she was gay. And the memory for her, because she achieved that role I talked to you about, and um, that role where you're, you're uh, it's called resident coordinator, requires you to do a lot of socializing. And she said, you know, I know I have the skills, but what I hate is going around to all those parties and all the diplomacy and stuff. I said, would well, you want to give this a try? And we did. And the memory was growing up gay in a Middle Eastern country and always being forced to wear dresses by her mother. And every social situation was painful for her. And a week later, after we did like two or three sessions a week later, she goes, what happened? Oh my god, I was out last night. It was like the easiest thing for me. Right? And then one of the early ones was someone who was in the 89 earthquake and always panicked at the sound of thunder and then was no longer triggered by thunder. I share this with you because this is the inside out work that's happening right now. All this work is, is a part of a body of work for really understanding human behavior that I feel like is really reaching a point of deep coherence in the culture. Because the goal, at least my goal, is to try to move us from having our lives be ordered by our circumstances and be more ordered by our intention. Because to me, that is what personal freedom is all about. And so that's what I wanted to share with you today. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>